You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. Oh my god, I can't. And I feel a little ironic. I have not. You haven't? Well, well, like you're familiar no. with like you guys. I think you guys started this. You guys. You guys. You guys. Yes. Me CrossFit. and my clan of CrossFitters. <laughs> <laughs> not stereotyping at all. Um, <laughs> no, like the box subscription thing. Yeah. Right. That's like that's a thing. You can get like Gains box is a big one. Give me. Fu- you know what? Bella Bella barbell box or something. What the fuck is that? It's for Bellas, the They're ladies, females. Fe- well. It's all the same now. <laughs> you don't discriminate. <laughs> uh, what is, yeah, I guess in CrossFit, you guys got a real issue with identifying um, who's who and what's what. Um, but, you know, that model of, like, you pay X and you get shit for, you just get dumb little samples. <laughs> we send of, you stuff every month. Yeah. You know what's a really bad was a clothing one. Have you ever seen these things? Yeah, what, they'll do, like, socks or underwears. Or- well, the socks are not bad. Like, when we had to go through clinic and we had to get dressed up all the time, Yeah, the socks one was like, oh, I just stopped doing laundry. <laughs> I'm just like, I got three socks. There's four weeks in a month. You know, do the math. Flip it inside out halfway through. And fucking throw them out at the end of the day. And then next month comes in, you got no brand new socks. You don't got to do laundry. Um, but no, there's a keto box, which is like, uh, you know what it is? It's, that's Silicon Valley. Like, you know how... Um, like there's always like mashups of things. Like when someone tries to explain what their app is, well, <laughs> it's like it's like the Uber of Airbnbs. You're like, what the fuck does that even mean? Like they just took like buzzy fitness terms. It's like, all right, keto is big. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, well, this monthly subscription stuff is big too. I got it. Keto box. And it's like fuck on it. So what do they send you? Like beef jerky and peanut butter? Uh, I, yeah, I just want one day there to like just to be an empty box or water, <laughs> just a box of water. Because there you go, yeah, as delivered. Here's your keto box. It's like, oh my god. I just, I, I mean, I get the idea of getting exposed to more things, but like if if you're just doubling down on the same position it's like i don't really get the keto movement to begin with um but yeah i found that to be uh, morally reprehensible <laughs> well the more i think about it i want peanut butter and beef jerky right now though well the best one we ever did was when we had pat barber on the show yeah as a thank you we sent him a box of bacon a bacon box that's which, right i mean if you're ever on the fence about coming on the show this is your fate you yeah. get <laughs> meat in the mail you're welcome <laughs> So uh, if you is that wanted, a keto box? I guess it kind of would be. But is that also paleo? I guess if it's uh, I don't know. You can put sugar on it, make it not paleo anymore. I think I would do that just out of spite. <laughs> um, there was a lot of that. Like, um, you know what I saw at the Olympia was a vegan bodybuilding booth. Hmm. Like the smallest people in there. <laughs> no, like, how's, no, that, how's that working out? For no you? animals were harmed during the spray tan. Oh my, yeah, right. Well, oh God. Um, all right, we're going Q and A. We're jumping in. All right, let's do it. You want to lead off? I'm going to eat during this. All right. Um, so this is from the RX Radio Q and A page. Let's see. We'll start off with who's the better Cairo, Jordan or Jordan? That is an easy answer. It is Jordan. clearly Jordan. <laughs> 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 all right. Thank you, Rob, for Rob Joiner. He, oh, mm. he's number one and two. He's a homie. Serious question. Perth, um, is there any special considerations for a Cairo or PT treating enhanced athletes? So I'm assuming enhanced. Yeah, I'm assuming enhanced. En- enhanced, enhanced. I don't know. It says enhanced. C H. Is that someone like you know I'm um, D one going to the league sort of thing? Is that? I would say that could be a drug question. That could be a very mass drug question. <laughs> like enhanced. I, I think enhanced, might enhanced. Be- I think it might mean just like elite athletes. Okay. I think empathy. Move, do shit yourself. Be in the same pursuit because I think a lot of what you're going to end up doing is psychological with athletes. Even more so. Maybe not more so, but just in a different way. Like there's a certain level you can get with power of suggestion with gen pop patients. You can just tell them they're better. I think, oh, well, fuck, look at that. I paid you a hundred bucks. I do feel better because they don't know how... 
they're not as in tune with their perception of how their body feels to begin with. Yeah. So that power suggestion goes a lot further where it's like you can't will an athlete better. The way I look at it is pain has a natural history, performance doesn't. So what I mean by that is when you read the literature on like low back pain or just like nagging injuries, it's more often than not, like if your back hurts this morning, give it two weeks, your back's not going to hurt, right? Mm -hmm. If you didn't do anything, like if you just woke up and it kind of hurt and there was no acute injury, give it time and it's not going to hurt. Right. That's called natural history. If you suck at lifting today and you keep sucking at lifting, in two weeks, you're still going to suck at lifting, yeah. right? So performance doesn't have a natural history. So I think as people who look to push the envelope of using chiropractic as an adjunct to increase athletic performance or enhanced performance in this case, uh, I think knowing the markers or the gold standard measurements of progress that are going to improve performance, and the best way to do that is try to perform yourself. So I think that you can you can weed out a lot of bullshit in conventional research for gen pop patients that doesn't transfer over, right? Like a lot of people think that, you know, oh, if glute strengthening is going to help low back pain patients that are between the ages of 25 and 34 sedentary males, but you got an 18 year old kid who wants to go to the show. It's like, you can't just think that, oh, okay, extrapolating from this, then more glute strength will be his answer. It's like, no, the dude's working on a whole nother spectrum, a whole nother like axis that he's operating on. So you can't just be so myopic in your principal application that you're like, okay, here's the research on this, go. Because if you try to go with that research, you realize you're not going to go very far. So thinking like more like an athlete, the best way to do that is just be an athlete. That'd be my take on it anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think of um, outcome. What is their goal? What are they trying to do? Because I've, I've worked with athletes um, with different goals. Some of them it's to overcome an injury, um, to rehab an injury. Others it's to increase performance. And it's a lot easier to help someone rehab an injury than it is to take a healthy athlete and make them a better athlete. Mm. Um, so you have to really be able to understand what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And within that, you have to have a well-regimented plan or um, – or uh, idea of how to get them from point A to point B. Yeah. So that's it's going to be different no matter what the sport is, whatever you're doing. Um, it's easy easier for me to think of it in terms of strength sports. So you know, weightlifters, powerlifters, crossfitters, things like that. Um, then maybe some some other sports like like football or jujitsu or things like that where it's. Um, they call it like during the draft or whatever the intangibles, like the things oh. that you can't necessarily measure that you know make someone the athlete that they are um it's not as linear when you're thinking in that aspect so you so you have to be able to maximize the things that that are a little bit more measurable or more so in your control um to be able to contribute to that them getting better in the, in the See, long run and that's the best fucking answer there is because a lot of practitioners what they do they get their hands on these intangible athletes and if you dealt with athletes you just know like, you know you're dealing Absolutely. with something that's just like... There's people that are just gifted. Yeah. And when you come across one, keep, keep your fucking head about you. Because too many people, too many practitioners try to lay claim to the performance of their athletes and what they're laying claim to based off of the... Like, TB12, right? This fucking Tom Brady nonsense. It's like, dude, your wife makes 10x what you make. Why don't you go home and make sure you got dinner ready when the time she gets home, <laughs> all right? Why don't you go fucking cut your hand open again before the Super Bowl, you fucking donkey? Like... <laughs> But, like, this TV 12 is this coach who's now actually being implicated for, like, he might have been juicing up some players. And that's why the muscle pliability fucking $400 foam roller shit's been working. It's like, yeah, Test E does pretty well. I don't think the foam roller in, on ice is doing shit. But, like, <laughs> don't fucking lay claim to the success of your clients or your patients. Yeah. Don't do that. You are there as an adjunct. You are privileged that these people trust you enough. Don't try and systematize and monetize this shit. You yeah. know what I mean? I 100% agree. Like, and you see it all the time with people like the guys that work with LeBron James. And it's like, because they, they're, le they're operating at a level of like obscurity that it's like, listen, the last thing, you know, like we said before, like you don't want Michael Phelps to teach you how to swim. It's like, if you're Michael Phelps' swim coach, yeah sure you're his coach but you're you're basically the best quote i've ever heard from a strength coach is i think it was jesse burdick brought this up in one of his podcasts and he said he heard it from i forget the i forget the player he was oh uh uh broncos qb 
Yeah. What was his name? Uh, Mark. No. Help me out. Um, John Elway. John Elway? <laughs> Broncos QB back in the day. All right. I know. The we Canadian have, knows more about football than the American. Well rounded. <laughs> I shot an AR fifteen the other week, so oh, I feel like America, I, yeah, it, just, yeah. it was coming in through the trigger finger. Just you know, like Yeah. The best part about that is the skull tobacco. The what? I'm making a joke saying you have to have a dip in. Oh, I can't do that, man. Yeah, no. So <laughs> through the AR-15, I got the Constitution. Yeah. We find these truths to be self-evident that all men are... Anyways. Um, <laughs> but no, I think people that just lay claim... So this guy said, my only job is to make sure John Elway doesn't trip over weights in the weight room. And that's where you, that's where you got to fucking keep your head. You got to keep pretty fucking humble. Like, it's cool to work with big name athletes and pro athletes. But you are not the reason they got there. No. Not by a fucking long shot. You are the reason that maybe 5%, like you'll extend their career by 5 or 10%. Maybe. And that's it. But it's like, oh, I'm going to spotlight this person. It's like, if they want to put you up and throw you out, cool. And then if you want to read, sure. But like people who just like get territorial over it, it's like, hey, you want to go get work with someone else? Go work with someone. I don't care. Like it's no skin off my nose. But I don't know how we ended up on that. Yeah, we just got there. Intangible for us. Yeah, intangibles. Yeah. So I just think that's a good answer. And if you want to work with athletes, understand that they're the, they're the star. You're not. Yeah. You don't matter. You're replaceable. To I mean, try to make yourself not. By and the more you can work with them, the more you can kind of understand the mindset behind that. But yeah, the physicality part is they're they're an anomaly, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so I got one for you. And we get a lot of questions from Cairo students. All right. I feel like that's a big base of our, our audience. This is weird to say audience. <laughs> it's weird to say audience. It feels weird to say fans. Yeah. A lot more people listen to us than I realize, I yeah. guess. So we appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Guys. But so Cairo students. Um so J R Shrek. Uh I'm in try to Ch chiropractic college. What advice can you give to be proactive? Now towards being a good doc when I graduate, question mark. Quarter two, or try to. So like, let's just call it quarter two. Yeah. Um, my best advice is to learn as much as you can and kind of weed through the bullshit and find your practical application for it. Mm -hmm. I use different techniques from, from different... Um, well, I use different parts of different techniques in chiropractic um, for various reasons, not necessarily always the reason they were taught to me for, oh. but for the applications that I have deemed them appropriate. Um, I work with, uh, I'd say, a pretty specific population. Um, I work with a lot of athletes, not not all, all different caliber athletes, So, um, but people that in some way or another identify as an athlete. Um even if they're just weekend warriors or they're really just an office worker that likes to do CrossFit, uh, whatever that is, <clears throat> I find that those people are very responsive when you give them more things to do as opposed to when you take away things mm -hmm. to do. Um, so I don't, yeah, it's kind of getting off topic, but um, when you're in school, dealing with that, figuring out what kind of audience you want to work with or what kind of clientele you want to work with and then um, learning as much as you can where you will have not an answer to every question, but you at least have um, a road to go down for, for most of the things that you'll encounter and then realize when it's something that's out of your scope and figure out you know, someone that you can refer them to that will help them. And that's an interesting principle you brought up with athletes is like they want to have more and not be taken away. Right. So if you think about there's a, like a lot of psychological research about loss aversion and motivation. Mm -hmm. And so it's usually done on common folk, non-athletes. So I think we may have talked about this in the past. There's an app and a website where it's, it's. I, I think it may have started with weight loss, but it's like across, across the board now. But it's like, rather than me saying, hey, Junta, if you lose 50 pounds, I'll give you $100. So I'd be giving you something. Now, to most people, that doesn't motivate them. What would what would motivate them is the reverse of that. If you don't lose fifty pounds, I'm going to take a hundred dollars for you. Loss aversion for the for the base population is a lot more of a a motivating factor than actual accruing, right? right? So, but that's how you know you're working with an athlete. 
when it's the flip side of that because mm-hmm. rather than weight loss and that it's like pain reduction and and like um corrective exercise or whatever whatever the intervention might be the athlete wants more the athlete wants when they're motivated by having more where it's like mm-hmm. you, the the desk jockey goes, Hey man, just, you know, don't do this as just much. Take it don't away. Do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't squat. Right. And that's how, you know, you work with that when they show up and he's like, fuck the last seven fuckers have told me not to squat. They want us to give them something. So that's right. a real hard switch. When you're on the fence, if someone identifies as an athlete, but they're driving for like the reduction, like the addition by subtraction. And there's a place for that. Sure. But real athletes are just like, they just come in and you tell them to do 10 things. They'll do 12. Right, yeah, and absolutely. so I think that's a, a assessment and an understanding each person that walks in your office. What that motivating? Are they going to be a loss aversion type non athlete? Are they going to be kind of a, an accruance, a, an, an adopter, a, yeah. a, a compliant? Compliance and athletics or high performers are one to one. Yeah, right. You can't be fantastic. Calm. Yeah. Um, wait, I, you shot that at me, or I shoot that at you? Um, you asked that to me, right. so yeah. Um, so basically what I'm saying is no, learn as much as you can, um, figure out what you think is good information and bad information. Um, and that's going to be different for everyone. Jordan probably thinks there's things that are more useful in practice than I do. Um, even though we practice very similarly, but, um, use those things to treat the population that, um, that you want to treat to accomplish the goal that you want to go and that, um, you want in your practice. Treat the patient, not the symptom. That yeah. was something I learned from working corporate. You treat the symptoms when you work a corporate job, blow your fucking brain out. Yeah. It's the same shit day in, day out. Very different people. Mm-hmm. So if you treat the patient, fulfillment. You treat the symptom, you're just fucking, you're either chasing the dollar figure or you'll burn out, man. Honestly, I think too many people, they have the same protocol for every every symptom yep. rather than having the same protocol or different protocols for different people. Yeah, 100% agree. Cool. Um, where are we going? Where are we going? Um, I like this one um, because this is one I talk about a lot in practice. Uh, David Bain, 001, meniscus tears. Should you have surgery? Should you train around them and how? I mean, depends on severity, I think. Depends on location. You know, medial versus posterior lateral, Gonna depending on how the force is going to get distributed through the knee and what activities you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, meniscectomies, because what you're dealing with is structural stability, I think removing it is bad more often than not. Like I have two blown me- medial meniscus. Like they're frayed up pretty good when I was playing hockey and just in a lot of loaded knee valves as a goalie. Um, I, as a general rule of thumb, those are one of the surgeries I push against. Like there are some that the the structural damage has put you below function threshold where you can actually overcome anything. Meniscus is not one of them because mm-hmm. the knee's stability is reliant totally on structure. It's like, let's see how far we can get by buffering the force that goes into that structurally damaged knee by improving the functional stability of the hip. Let's start there. Isometrics, uh, progression in, in knee flexion, unilateral work, things like that. Again, depends on, like, this is not medical advice. Please seek a physician, blah, 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 disclaimer. But I think a lot of times you can get very far with function around the knee because the knee is entirely structural. So... Uh, the problem with once you get that MRI report, that's a scapegoat, right? You have a gold standard assessment of structure and a practitioner who's not in tune with a gold standard assessment of function. So you need to find one that can give you a, an equally weighted counterpoint through the other lens of function rather than just the myopic view through the lens of structure because it's very easy for a surgeon to be like, oh, that's why you're having all the pain. It's like, well, n- no, like can fucking stand on one leg or if your other leg's equally as shit it's like well you can go in and fix it but you're just going to be putting force through that path of least resistance and you're just going to keep wearing it away so meniscus is one that I'll, I'll even if i don't manage it in my office and they want to go through insurance to go through pt i'll definitely push that route first before sending them uh, back to the ortho for a consultation to get surgery on it um, that being said if they want to just go in and clean it up, most most of the orthos are good, and they'll try and leave as much meniscus as they can. Full meniscectomies are rare these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what you said. Yeah. I think it depends on um, what their motivation is in wanting to get this meniscus looked at. Hmm. Um, so if it's someone that's just going to you know, sit on the couch the rest of their life, doesn't have much to do, then 
why? Why do you need to get this surgery? You're yeah. just it's just gonna put you at a lower starting point after that rehab and the PT that you're probably not gonna do, so you're probably gonna end up with more pain in that knee resulting from the surgery than initially. If it's someone that, you know, the knee's locking on you and and you know, you're very active, maybe you're a runner or you play sports on the weekend, whatever it is, um, I'd say Again, this is a pretty minor procedure at this point. If it's something that's inhibiting you from doing the things that you want to do, then surgery might be an option. But I always push the conservative route uh, first as well. Um, I've had plenty of people that were coming to me uh, contemplating surgery that after you know six weeks of really focused rehab, focusing on, like you said, hip stability, um, just making that that entire lower extremity function better that they don't even have pain anymore. Mm. So it can be the way that you're stressing the knee. Uh, you might not even know that it's, that it's an abnormal way or that you're, what you're doing on a day to day basis could be causing the pain and the meniscus might be just an incidental yeah. finding. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my take on it. Um, I want next question. Uh, and I hope we can find some areas to like debate or disagree. All right. A dot M training. Thoughts on how you would improve slash change the McGill Big Three. The Mag McGill Big Three. All right. Um, so this is what the curl up for side plank bird dog. Side plank bird dog. If I'm not mistaken, side plank might be something different, but I'm pretty sure that's it. Okay. Um, that's a good question on how I might change them. Improve slash change. Improve. Slash Let me pose it scale. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Because I think fundamentally, the research is there. It's, yeah. But the research is there. And with that, the limitations in research as a whole are also there. So I think that's something that has to be taken into consideration with him. And it's something to his credit, which makes him the fucking goat, is he'll tell you that. If you listen to his stuff, if you read his stuff, he says, yeah, this is, this is going to work for you know, a high percentage of the population because a yeah. high percent of the population isn't high performing. Now, it might be a good starting point to retest post-injury based off of pain triggers of an advanced athlete, whether you have disc injuries or what your pain is. But this has to ramp up, right? Strength and stability, it has to scale. You can't right. put the cart before the horse. So right. how would you, I guess, improve, change, or I'm going to add scale the McGill Big Three? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's a good, like you said, it's a good starting place. Those three, um, I've had very low-level deconditioned athletes that, you know, for the most part, they can start there and they can do those mm -hmm. things to some degree. Um, scaling up, I think, is very important. And uh, a lot of it, what it comes down to is core strength, spinal stability, and um, glute strength is a big part of it as well. So... <laughs> Are you trying to eat very <laughs> quietly? I've tried to. <laughs> Just fucking chow down the and be done with it. The most sexual way to uh, eat food. <laughs> Uh, can you just repeat I've that? I've got. It's, it's, it's now cached <laughs> on the internet forever. Oh, my God. Carry All on. Right. Anyways. <laughs> um, but, yes, the McGill Big 3 should not be an ending point. If you're really good at bird dogging, that doesn't transfer to be <laughs> being really good at life. I've never or, heard it. Bird yeah. dogging. <laughs> Sounds like you got it. Never mind. Um, so, I think... <laughs> so, the bird dog is good in, in the way that... Um, um, it requires a lot of, of basically core and spinal stability, core referring to the trunk. So there's a lot of muscles in there um, that I'm not going to name specifically. But I think a great way to scale up something like that would be some sort of um, maybe unloaded lunge. So something where you're bearing, you're you're loading the spine, so you're engaging the muscles around the spine to stabilize that. The lunge is great for lower body um, stability, unilateral um, glute, quads, all that stuff. Um, so I think that's a really good way to improve that. Along with um, a single leg deadlift is a really good one mm. too. Um, I think it's a very similar stimulus on the glutes. Um, the core, maybe not as much. If you're loading it, maybe maybe a little bit more then. Yeah. Um, the planks, I'd say a scaled version of that, something we actually do on prescript, are, are holds, like a front rack hold. Yeah. Or um, if you have, like, a, I've talked about Atlas Stone or sandbag holds, things like that, is a great scale, I think, for a plank if you want to really intensify that stimulus. Um 
The nice thing with that is that's easily scalable. Right? Absolutely. A 20 Absolutely. pound versus a 50 pound versus a 100 pound versus a 200 pound sandbag. Yeah. What? Because what you're doing is stability is because we debate on this and then people fucking pick Camp Junta or Camp Shallow and then it's like, well, it's the same thing. It's like you have a center of mass and a base of support, right? A combined center of mass or center of gravity, right? Because center of mass has to do with the relative position of the force of gravity due to the position, right? That has to do with speed. <laughs> so the taller you are, the more difference you'll have between center of mass and center of gravity. We're conferring with our with our insight physicist with our physicists slash on, fucking on rocket site. man. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, what's that, Mark? Hey, fucking shallow. <laughs> All right. You got to get Mark mic'd up. <laughs> um, but so in that case, the heavier object will have will deviate your combined center of mass or gravity greater than a smaller object. So you are yes. going to induce a greater stimulus of instability. Yes. Right? So, so you I, have something pulling you off balance. Yeah, and then that's where the core strength comes in. So I, I dig it. I think cool. that's. I think the holds is good. I would say. So I'm break one. Break these down individually. I think for me, real easy. Single leg RDL loaded with the hand of. Because think about it. The posterior oblique sling is really the mechanism. Well, the thoracolumbar fascia is the mechanism of correction through the bird dog, and a lot of people miss that. That that's what's going to give you your. It's like a hybrid function structure stability relationship, which makes the low back really unique in the sense that the, like, the thoracic spine is entirely structural for the most part. Ribs, but then the shoulders almost primarily functional. There's a coming together of structure and function in the low back where the ribs stop, and then you have the five vertebra with, that are reliant on technically function with the core strength, but it's more than that because the lats tie into the thoracolumbar fascia, the TVA, the internal oblique, and the glutes. So when you have, think of the bird dog, the way you're loading, it's like, well, if my left shoulder is fully extended, or fully flexed, rather, my lats engage on my left side, and my right hip's fully extended, my right glute max is engaged on the right side, it's via that thoracolumbar fascia that that stability is held. But now think of this like counterbalanced position with one side, one, like the opposite and opposite loaded, like the hand and shoulder. There's, a ro there's an anti-rotation moment there, internal oblique, and then there's also... Um, an anti-extension moment there, transverse abdominis. So it gets every muscle of the thoracolumbar fascia kind of on board at the same time. And if you have a break in the chain, you'll notice an instability on one side or the other. So when you load that or scale it, single leg RDL. Okay, so if my right hip's going in extension, my left foot's staying down, then I want right glute max, left lat. So I want to load the lat, so dumbbell in the hand of the left foot. You just flexed your pec at me. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was a seal of approval. Um, <laughs> we're, the rest of the show is just going to be done through blinks and, and <laughs> flex twice for yes. Um, so I think that's a good way to do it. Uh, planks, uh, side plank, the Copenhagen plank. I don't even Get know what that times, is. people. That's a big one. That's Copenhagen been helping my plank. quad rehab huge. Tell me what this is. So if you're, I forget the numbers, but it's something like 70, it's somewhere in the 73 or 78%. If you don't have adductor strength within the 78% or 73% of abductor strength of the hip, your increased likelihood of injury is through the roof. Seems like a very so, abstract number. I mean, yeah, well, that's research <laughs> for you, right? Like ART, you're supposed to hold for like 3.2 seconds at the end or something like that. It's arbitrary would probably be the best way to put it. But So imagine doing a side plank where the top leg is up on the bench holding your body. So if you're doing a side plank, left elbow down, right foot on a bench, and then try and pull your left foot up, right? So that's your anterior oblique sling. So that's going to be your obliques on one side and your adductor on the other. Bottom side is going to be the external obliques, then limiting that lateral flexion, and the top leg is going to be the adductors, like keeping the pelvis in a stable position. So I would say that's a really good one. Okay. All like you it. fucking powerlifters out there, if you have a patient, and all you chiropractors, if you have a patient that lays down on your table, or if this is you, and immediately their feet flare out to the sides and their toes are facing either side of the room, that, that is huge. Like, I'll get people to try and reset their, like, femurs and I'll just get them to, like, um, I'll put my fist between their knees in, like, a hook line position, have them squeeze in, and just hear that pop. Yep. I'll have people who are so weak that they can barely even get their knees to my hand. It's like, okay, that's a huge red flag for me in adductor strength, right? And I think adductors work in conjunction with the core to stabilize the pelvis, right? Where abductors work to stabilize the hip. 
So a lot of adductor strains come down to core weakness because there's not enough, you're not buffering enough force centrally and you're putting too much force distal to stabilize the pelvis. So that lateral side plank position, that's going to be a very unstable position of the pelvis because if you don't use your core and your adductors, your pelvis is going to drop to the floor, right? So I think that Copenhagen plank, and there's so many variations you can do where like hold the leg up and then put the bottom leg through flexion extension, like gait cycle, like hips are meant to function, right? So I think that's a big one for the side plank. Um, what I bird dog and what was the last one? Curl up, curl up, curl. Up. I like the uh, GHR, the reverse setup on the GHR. If okay. you guys want, it's in the prescript YouTube channel. It's like a face down, face up, face so up. So not like a GHR, like an actual glute ham raise. Oh, or, I'm sorry, saying. GHD, as it were, to the cross. The R threw me off. I don't. Well, fuck you. We, it's our word. You don't get to use it. <laughs> um, so if for us, it's like you flip it upside down. We did that core progression on like um, transverse and right, right, the right, ab right, wheel, I think. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, deviate, again, spinal stability. It's the same principle that you use. You just use weight. I just use leverages to deviate the combined center of gravity outside of a base support and mm -hmm. to have that core act um, more so as an anti-extender than a prime mover through lumbar flexion, lateral flexion, rotation, whatever. Yeah. Good question. Cool. Love it. Cool. Shoot. Um, all right. Let's stick with the rehab. Why not? Given that physical... Th uh, this one's from Josh Davis, too. Given that physical therapy and chiros tend to underload movements in the clinic, yellow therabands, and you guys might be able to see this. Wait, Erico, hey, <laughs> fuck yeah, Erico, we're Maybe, over there, over there. given our history, probably <laughs> not. <though. laughs> this will never see the light of day. Um how do you introduce heavy compound movements such as dead squats, et cetera, to the general patient? Yeah. So, I, so I, just I to the patient. Saying. Yeah. So for me, it's like, it's weird. Someone called me out on me saying the word it's like. I but saw that. Speaking in metaphor is the easiest way to compare two things. Anyways. Um, so now I'm like really conscious about it. Fuck you, man. Whoever said that? It's rude of a day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> understand that rehabilitation has to exist outside of the the dualistic relationship between volume and intensity. I think that's where a lot of people lose the plot. And that goes in training. So that spectrum that exists isn't a spectrum linear based off of two, two axes of volume and intensity. If volume is high, intensity is low. And if intensity is high, the volume is low, right? There's so many more stimulus adaptations that we can make that will dictate our progress, like range of motion. I think range of motion, like if we're talking deadlift, mm -hmm. range of motion is huge. It's like, okay, we don't need to go off the floor right away. All we're really doing is reinstating the hinge. Okay, spinal stability in a, in a structurally unstable position. Yep. For, so for me, my two big ones was squat and deadlift. Blocks for deadlifts. And then um, the deviation of the center of gravity for squats. So, so front squat. So depending, Goblet right? Goblet squat. Yeah, front or counterbalance, counterbalance, counterbalance goblet, front, high bar, low for knee, and then okay. pretty much the reverse of, or sorry, for, for hip, and then pretty much the reverse of that for knee. Because you're going to, if your knees are painful, then it's like, all right, we're going to go Less knee flexion. low bar or safety squat to a box. We're going to minimize that knee flexion moment. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to scale it. And I actually had a discussion with um, Eric Schwartz. He's kind of run show over at Animal and Universal. And he was having his knee issues. And it's like, well, how do you reintroduce using like uh, training adjuncts to improve that? Like he was talking about, and I'll get this question about a lot about knee wraps. Well, it's like, okay, let's think of like gradations between one and two. Let's say one is low bar and two is high bar. So if we're worried about crossing a threshold that exists somewhere between like a load threshold, somewhere between one and two, somewhere between low bar and high bar when it comes to the like knee injuries, he's like, well, what about knee wraps? I'm like, well, let's look at it this way. One is going to be low bar with no wraps. 1.33 is going to be low bar with wraps on. Then it's going to be like, well, then you put on sleeves. Well, that's like 1.66, and then you go high bar, right? So you just use these things to bridge the gap in between. So as you introduce, so when he goes from high bar to front squat, it's like, okay, let's go front squat with wraps, right? Same weight. We're not going to change the weight, but we're just going to give you a little bit extra in that deepest knee flexion moment. And then we're going to keep the same weight again, but rather than scaling the stimulus on the bar, we're just going to scale the perception of the stimulus at the knee. We're going to give it more external support than give it less. Okay. Knee so sleeves. you're using them as support. Yeah. So, so sleeves, more support. 
I'm sorry. Raps. raps more support, sleeves less support. Then, then we're going yeah. raw. So we're going. <laughs> yeah, we're not. Um, so yeah. So if low bar is one, so go low bar with wraps first. Low bar with uh, sleeves. Low bar raw. High bar wraps sleeves raw. Front wrap sleeves raw. Because I think the trick there, if you're doing, if you're focusing on the corrective work that put you in the position or the corrective work that was lacking in your programming to put you in or to increase your perception of stability in these unstable positions, what you've done by implementing that, that scale, that, that graded scale of going from not one to two, but 1.33, 1.662, 2.33, from going from low high to front, yeah. you've now stretched out six weeks worth of correctives underneath that progression right yep. so now you're making a lot of it's it's just, it's parents grinding up fucking vegetables in your spaghetti sauce it's, it. it's, 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 what happens is they're making these jumps every week but what the the underlying issue that they're not even cognizant about if you're programming properly is waving and, in, and intensifying so you're progressing the stimulus of instability as you move into these into these new waters it's like when you play a sport they teach you first thing hot when you're playing hockey as a kid. Don't pass to where the player is, pass to where he's going to be. That's how you have to think about implementing corrective work. You need to test and put the cart before the or put the horse before the cart. Let's test the stability because clearly we left that unattended and then our strength ran away from us and we got hurt. So let's, you know, if we're going to front squat next week, I want to see a progression in that instability work first and an ability to overcome that progression so then you can graduate into the next loading parameter. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that anyone who's doing rehab should understand is that there's more stimulus than just weight and intensity or um, weight and volume, right? Intensity and volume. Yeah. So um, another one that you didn't mention too is uh, tempo. Boom. I find that that's maybe like the the 1.2 or 1.1 even on that scale. Yeah. I'll throw people into even if it's partial partial range of motion with the tempo um just to get them moving again get get them feeling the stimulus of i'm doing something yeah. taking it back to that give them more as opposed to take away and i think that too helps apply the new found transient stability back into and rework the motor pattern right because when you have to go slow you're like oh shit my knee's coming in Rather than if you dive bomb it, you're not really going to know. You're just going to mm -hmm. be A to B, and you're not going to feel the difference all the way down. Yep. Dig it. Cool. Um, a lot of questions about the uh, the U.S. Open thing. Cover that in the last podcast. <laughs> um, trying to find something specific to you. To me. Oh, I like this question. All right. Are there any training principles, or so this is just underscore G85, any training principles or strategies that you've changed your opinion on? So like things just that in recent life. Yeah, just like you know when you maybe not when you started training because I think we were all pretty dumb when we started training. Yeah. But like, and because this is going to be two things. That's a really good question. This is going to be some of it's going to be chronological. Some of it's going to be because you're stronger now. You have to change if you want to yeah. keep adapting. So I want you to break apart what's changed fundamentally in your training, like the way you look at it, and that maybe just would be more from the education side, yeah. and what's had to change based off of your your aptitude and your ability. So now what do you have to change to overcome those plateaus? Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, when I was younger and less educated, I, I um, a big part of my training was I have to go hard all the fucking time. And I could do it because... I, I mean, as I was younger, I could recover from it. I wasn't dealing with quite as much weight because I wasn't quite as strong. Um, so that was just my mindset. That's kind of why I had, I mean, I won't really call it success, but I was as, ex as successful as I was in CrossFit. It was because I just had that mentality of, fuck it, I'm going hard, and I'm going to go harder tomorrow, and the next day I'm going to go harder, and I'm going to be more fit because I went hard all week, so I'm going to go harder next fucking week. But does that benefit but, you in CrossFit? Like, um, yes, to some extent. And I think that's and, where people and, lose it. Um, it benefited me in CrossFit. I won't say it benefits all in CrossFit. Does it, do you know someone who's at the games and at regionals or, or a high performing CrossFit athlete that doesn't have that mentality? And is it just the weeding out process I, of genetic predisposition that it filters out? To some degree, yes. Yeah. But there are athletes who are a lot smarter about their training, yeah. I'll say. Um, there's a couple athletes, one of the, the women on 
Rich Froning's team, who just recently won the games this last year. Um, her name's Lindy Barber. She had a, a pretty bad back injury. Um, she Maybe a spondy or something like that um, that she had to overcome, and she's now you know winning the CrossFit Games on a team. So there's people... Um, I think she has like a whole blog and website about it too. Yeah. But there's people who are just a little bit smarter about the train than that go hard all the time mindset. Yeah. Um, and I think CrossFit in itself, it's such a sub-maximal um, sport in a lot of ways yeah. that it, it, it allows that to some extent. But again, there's that mindset um, is something I weeded out over time yeah. uh, because of injuries. I got back from my first individual regionals and i'm like fuck it i'm going harder because i'm gonna do better next year i i like i don't even know i never got imaging on it but i fucked up a wrist I really, laser really that, bad like, yeah daily, really that. bad probably about a week later just because i was i wasn't recovering yeah um you know you peak for something and then you you feel awesome because you're stronger more fit whatever it is than you've ever been but then you realize that you have to kind of taper off that so that you can peak higher next time and i just that was my, you know, kind of wake up call of that. Yeah, it's the thing actually, with CrossFit is like the workouts are if they're programmed correctly, you yeah. can redline subjectively all the time, but you what you'll realize is you're redlining different energy systems. As yeah. long as that energy system one, when you come back through the cycle again, is recovered. Right. And you know, redlining energy system two, three, four, and five are going to decrease your ability to recover to energy system one. But it's not like we're just doing strength work year round. Like we're just fucking loading the bar. Right, right. And some of it's cardiovascular, some of it's um, coordination, endurance, gymnastics, stuff like that. And that's a great statement because you start it with if it's programmed correctly, yeah. which a lot of times it's not, and a lot of times will lead to injury. Yeah. Well, that was CrossFit's big issue out of the gate, right? Right. It took a while to kind of get it right and get some, get more people in there that knew what they were doing to program for this sort of stuff. Gotcha. Um, and then to answer the second part of your question, something I do now differently that I am stronger than I have ever been. Um, and it's kind of the same answer. It's recovery. Yeah. Um, I, I used to be to the point where I could, you know, burn the candle at both ends and be fine and come out, you know, fine. But between like... <laughs> Bro, we just got back from Vegas. We got to record. No, no, not yeah, happening. No, I'm dude, fucking going to bed. Fuck you. We'll do it later. <laughs> that, is, that is a perfect example because... Um, I'm getting to the point now where, where if I have a more stressful week than normal, if I have, you know, a couple hours less sleep than normal, I feel it in, they, in every if they single run by session. reruns of MASH last night. I'm, I'm fucking useless. That's, that's right. Get the fuck off my lawn. <laughs> if I miss my one a day, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all that. Oh God. I, I well, when you're per per pushing yourself to perform at, at your highest limits and you are, pushing those limits back, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, it's going to be those little things that start to affect you more and more. Yeah. Um, and it takes someone, to, it takes a lot of consciousness to be able to kind of figure out what it is. Um, and, and maybe some experience. I've been doing this long enough now that I know that, you know, these things are, that's going to fuck me up or I'm going to feel that in training or I, I felt that in training last week. So I'm not going to do that again this week. But that's a badge of honor, man. And I think too many people look to bear that badge of honor without fucking earning it. It's like, yeah, recovery fucking matters, but you're not strong enough to get hurt. So get back in the yeah. fucking ring and take more punches. <laughs> then when you're on the mat, I'll tell you when you need to worry about recovery. Because yeah. I think too many people are just, there's such a market for it. And there's people are so fucking gullible. It's like, I want to see, I want to see like blood, sweat, tears, bruises, uh, fucking, I just want to see you broken before you need to talk about recovery. Because when you preemptively yeah. strike it, it's like, have fun being mediocre for yeah. the rest of your fucking life. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. It's really frustrating to me to hear like these fucking crunchy granola professional stretching people being like, you know, sitting in some fucking 90 90 position preaching to me about recovery. It's like recovery from what? You fucking 30 minute kin stretch class? Blow me, you <laughs> piece of shit. It's so frustrating. Yeah, it definitely can be an excuse for people that chronically underperform. Um, I think the best thing you could do is have an avatar. Like, have someone that you idolize in the sport. Like, what is your highest aspiration in lifting? I think when you can identify that, you can reverse engineer how to allocate your time very well. Yeah, because I, I agree. A lot of people, a lot of people want to be rich, froning, and then when you reverse engineer and you watch like the day in the life where he trains like seven times, and yeah. the camera crew shows up and he's already on the aerodyne, it's like 
really? You still want to be rich? You still mm-hmm. want to do that? Where it's then fine, you know, you want to be some fucking yogi that that does pop up stretch classes and you know can do the splits as a man. Ooh. All right, reverse engineer from there. Fine, go ahead. It won't take you very long. Well, that's the thing is people reverse engineer and they only peel back that first layer. Yeah. So that's why you have these idiots on the Tom Brady whatever TB12, it is. TB twelve. TB twelve. Supplyability. Because they're like, oh, we gotta get royalties. <laughs> yeah. Tom Brady's doing this. This is gonna make me a great football player like him. Oh my god, I'm fucking awesome. Mm. Except you don't see the hours he puts in in practice or the real strength and conditioning that he or does the and all this shit. Yeah, the well, intangibles, the fucking millions of dollars he has to give himself the you know most optimal setup to perform at his best for as long as he has. Yeah, I mean, look at us. We're sitting in wooden Adirondack chairs. What a I, sacrifice! Am I gonna fucking train after this? Are you, I can't people work think in these conditions. That we have it gender. easy. Jeez. <laughs> I'm actually, gonna, it's funny. I'll, I'll segue because this is. Back to the kind of the chiropractic thing, um, uh, more so on the business side of things, which, again, I walked in here with seven reusable grocery bags. <laughs> I, am, no, the, I go, yeah, uh, Shallow's really killing the game. If Were you, Louis v? If you, Jones. If you show Jones, up bro. with a shopping cart one day, <laughs> I will just fucking it's lose it. It's the natural progression, man. <laughs> um, okay, what business advice would you give Cairo students planning on opening their own practice right out of school? Oh, man, prepare to be broke for a couple of years. How long has it been? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, got, I mean, I have, I have a few points, but I'll let you run on it first. Other uh, than like yeah. the obvious being so poor that it hurts. Yeah, right. Um, I think a big thing is you, you I, I mean, this kind of goes back to my advice before, is you need to figure out your market. You need to figure out where you're going to go, what you're going to do. How are you going to run your business? Make sure you have enough money to, to get started in what you're doing um, and just to sustain yourself for enough time until you can turn a profit, which probably is going to be longer than you want it to be. Yeah. Um, and then with that, just treat people well. If I mean, it's that's something I've learned more than ever, opening my own business. If you treat someone well and you can relate to them, form a relationship with them, then they they will come back to you. It doesn't matter if it's next week, next year, no. you know, two years down the road, they'll remember that and they will come back to you. And they will, you know, maybe if they don't come back to you, they'll tell someone looking for a chiropractor to come back to you. So just be fucking decent to people and don't be a, a sleaze bag trying to steal people's money. Really, that needs to be said these yeah. days because there's so many fucking sleaze bags. But it's yeah, true. prepare for the financial hibernation that you're going to go into. Yeah. Because the second you graduate, winter's coming. <laughs> Winter is coming. <laughs> like, it's fucking brutal. Um, but that's, that's the hard part because those two fly in the face of each other, right? Like, right. integrity, when, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, if you got to eat, if the difference is you start ripping people off or you eat hot food, you got to be ready to not eat hot food if you want to keep integrity, right? Like, you got to be True. cans of tuna and fucking oats. And if that's how you got to sleep at night because you're not fucking ripping people off, it'll come. Because the thing is, out of the gate, people get possessive with their patients. Like, I, yeah. I know people are like, oh, I have this many, but they have 20 patients, but they're seeing them six times a week. Yeah. And it's like, all right, you'll, those might be the only patients you ever have if you operate like that. But out of the gate, they get that they get that um, immediate um, satisfaction, that pat on the back, the financial kick. It's like, oh, fuck, I'm going to make it. I do. I, I'm three years old. I still don't know. Some, some days I'm just like <laughs> looking at the bank accounts going, all right, I guess we're going to like go down the Embarcadero and pick up stra- change on the street for today. Um, <laughs> I just think start while you're in school and like let – Hopefully, you're passionate about something outside of chiropractic yes. that oh, allows so you for the niche to pick you, right? Mm-hmm. To, to, to not not understand a market, just identify your market, right? Like, you fucking play chess, go play chess. Chess players sit a long time. They could be <laughs> instructed on things. And it's, it's true. Because I, be I watch- Be part of a community. Yeah, but I, I just, ah, oh, fuck. Powerlifting is a little bit more on the fringe, but CrossFit's a little bit more accessible with a- I mean, the the demographic info on CrossFit is like aligns almost perfectly with the demographic info on chiropractic patients. Yeah, and so seeing you get into uh, CrossFit like almost quarter one, I feel like we had one chest workout with me, you, and Tyler Dickinson, and you're like, <laughs> "I'm good. Yeah, whatever Wait. is going on here, <laughs> you're gonna grab what size dumbbells? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go throw things on the other, and yeah. then you join. But by the time you got to tenth quarter and you were in clinic, and you had everyone and their mother coming through, and then I had a similar experience with 
just training in the gym that we were doing well. And everyone's like, well, wait, aren't those the kids that have the worst grades? <laughs> and it's like, that's right, bitch. <laughs> the name's Jordan. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, and then, but you were able to form a relationship and build an experience and build a rapport. Like you could hear your kids talking with their patients in clinic and you're just like, Oh, this is so awkward. This is like fucking painful. This is like watching an episode of The Office in real time. <laughs> this is like, so do you like stuff? It's like, oh my God, I'm just going to pull the fire alarm to get this person out of here. Um, so I think start right away. Like, yeah. I mean, we kind of took two routes on the social media thing. I started like a year out, and you started like, one day you woke up and was like, I think I want to do an Instagram account. And next week you're at like 10,000 followers. And I was like, motherfucker, here I have been working for like a year. This guy's just coming out of the woodwork. But I think, yeah, start now and don't. Don't seek out because that's what people did. It was nauseating to watch people get in and even coming here. Motherfuckers were coming here into your fucking wheelhouse trying to like snake, like, all right, you're going to do <laughs> so true, dude. a 185 pound deadlift and you think you're going to outrun Junta in his house? Like, get the fuck out. Check the name on the wall, homie. We got Junta regional flags all over this place. You're making me feel so good right well, now. Well, fuck, dude, it was so frustrating because, like, because everyone thought it was easy. Like, I'll just right. go join a box, and it's like, people will respect me. It's like, no, they won't. That's not how it works. <laughs> um, so I think that'd be my advice, is just start early. Like, start yeah. early and be, identify. Be worth respecting. Yeah, be passionate about something that's not chiropractic. No, I or, 100% or making that. money. It, yeah, it, it really doesn't matter what it is. Like you said, it could be chess. It could be, you know, it could literally be, it could be video games. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is. If you have a community of people that, that rely on you and trust you and respect you, then they'll take care of you. Dig it. Cool. Um, oh, wait. I had a good one. Give me a minute to oh, find this fuck. one again. This is... I yep. mean, this might be funnier than anything we've said. Um, I'm nervous. I know. Hold on. Hold on. My, my scrolling. We should, like, cue up the... We should have the Jeopardy music ready. Yeah. We just cue up the Jeopardy music for these long pauses. I fucking lost it. Hold on. Hold on. Maybe you should talk about something because I don't think I'm going to find this. If someone wants a uh, big fan and fuck you to be a regular segment, we kind of fell off that. Okay. Um, no, seriously, talk about something else. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, this question, I'll, I'll just take this question real quick. Um, bicep femoris pain, I think is a big... Things really misunderstood. Okay. So the question's long. Did you find it yet? No, I didn't. So you go for okay. this one. Hey, love your knowledge. Thanks for sharing. I have so much your helpful tips saved. I've had this lower butt hamstring injury for seven months. Thought it was piriformis. Spent way past my budget on body work. Everything from massage, chiropractic, dry needle, and cupping. Nothing seems to be helping. After doing lots of reading, I think it could be my bicep femoris. How do I release the pain? So sick of my hamstring hurting. Um, Bicep femoris, what makes it different is its actual position or its action on the tibia. So if you're missing external rotation in the hip and if you're loading things into an externally rotated position, like say you're doing sumo deadlifts, right? The foot is going to go where the tibia tells it to go and the tibia gets told to go where the femur tells it to go. But if the femur doesn't rotate because your hips are tight, what will happen is you're, you're going to put that foot where you want it. And what you could be doing is actually shortening the bicep femoris to laterally rotate the tibia and then getting your foot objectively where you want it, people need to realize that the physics and biomechanics are different for a reason. Physics says that the distance between two points is a straight, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? Can we get on board with that? Marky blinks twice for yes. Hey, Shell, fuck you. <laughs> what, what was that, Mark? <laughs> you say, fuck you, Shell? <laughs> but in, in your body, it works like lightning. Lightning finds the path of least resistance. Can we agree on that? Sure, he's humoring us. <laughs> fuck you, fuck you, Joe. <laughs> fuck me then. Uh, but I think that's and if you set up that trajectory between point A being the foot, point B being the hip, and the path of least resistance is now routed through that lateral hamstring because it has to rotate the tibia, rather than that point being set from external rotation of the hip. A lot of times you can get bicep femoris issues from that. And so like sumo deadlifting, the biggest thing with sumo deadlifters usually is that is that bicep femoris because they're in um, the hip. Uh, extended position the knees are kind of you know they're 
slightly bent, the hamstring is going to be act more active off the floor. Then when they pull, it's like, well, you're putting a lot of force through that chain and like what's coming up is just the light on the dashboard. Yeah. So either it's at the ischial tuberosity where the hamstring is going to insert or the bicep is going to insert the most laterally or it's at the knee where you're going to get that. People might think it's their IT, but it's a little bit too posterior and it's a bicep femoris. Lateral line stretching. Love it. Look it up. That'll probably Love be it. one of the biggest things because you pull that lateral line across, so you pull, you stretch into hip adduction on that side that's involved. How far down do you start to feel the stretch? Excuse me. You should feel it up in your QL, QL or external QL. oblique. You right. want stretches to centralize over time, not to per peripheralize. If you're starting to feel that lateral line behind the knee, you've accumulated a lot of peripheral tension that needs to be cleared up. And a lot of that tension will come from the bicep femoris and its action at the tibia. You like find it. it? Yeah, I did. Beauty. Yeah. Fire. So, <laughs> so this is Kevin Drew. Kevin, okay. who are you? What does it take for you guys to guest lecture at a university? Kids at my school need some RX radio in their life. Uh, an unaccredited school <laughs> is what you need. <laughs> a school with zero, zero respect for themselves or their students. Yeah, some good insurance. I would do maybe. it in a heartbeat. Um, I would do it, absolutely. Yeah, but, um, Ky the Cairo school or just like a regular? I, I like to know. do it at a regular Let's, uh, school. I like to go to like a PT school. I think, I mean... Actually, no. Maybe Cairo would be better because I think we speak more outside the, the the accepted scope of chiropractic and probably right. more within the scope of physical therapy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would. I've had uh, Parker, um, Parker kids from Parker listen and reach out a lot. Really? Um, Is that Texas? Texas. Yeah. Because yeah. so I was when I was in Texas, I spoke at a gym in Plano, and a few students came out. Um, yeah, and I think just. That would be cool if we could do that, but I would imagine they would lay down a fair amount of um, stipulations and things we can't yeah. say, and then we would never get invited back because we'd say them anyways. <laughs> uh, I spoke at Palmer last year. You did? Yeah. One of the clubs had me in. Nice. And, yeah. Like word got to administration and they were like, wait, isn't that the kid we tried to kick out of school? Uh, yeah, could we not have him come in again? That'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Because they're still dealing with like shithead kids that keep like pushing back at, at some of the clinicians. So it's like, I don't know um, what our future holds, but if a club wants to reach out and fly us up, I'll fucking do it. All right. There we should you go. record live. Record live? Record live from, As we from present? one of the schools. Yeah. Oh, that'd be Just awesome. Unedited, raw. Um, but all right, I think that's enough for today. Yeah. Um, you know what we might do? Is some of these are actually so good, we might just do full episodes on them. Yeah. Um, so we'll leave yeah, that for now. Good ones if you guys there. have questions, individual seems to be best. So either at the underscore muscle underscore doc or at uh, red, white, and Jordan. Red, white, and Jordan. White better. spelled incorrectly, W-I-T-E. It's true. Um, Should I post more on the, on the functional chiro? I don't know. I thought it was, dude, you were running for a bit. I know. We had a bit of like a following arms race and it was just like, what's Junta trading at today? And you're just like, meh. <laughs> we got the hardware for it. All, All we right. need is time. That's time. All right. All right. Um, I think that's it for today. All right, guys. Thanks for listening.